Hello and welcome to another Raspberry Pi video by me, the Raspberry Pi Guy. In today's upload, I'll be interviewing Raspberry Pi trading CEO, Evan Upton. A few weeks ago, the foundation invited me to grill him with everything you guys and girls want to know about what's going on, with topics ranging from the display module to future plans for Raspberry Pi. We sent out a community request for questions, hundreds of you submitted them, and here is what Evan had to say in reply. First off, what's happening with the promised DSi display? It appears to be a running theme in my interview videos as far back as February 2014. Lots of people are wondering, are we any closer to seeing it be released for purchase? Yeah, so we decided to cancel the display because it's, it's just making me look like a complete imbecile in every interview I give. I was on stage at TechCrunch last year in front of John Biggs and I made myself look like an idiot in front of John. So I, I cancelled it back in January and I didn't tell anyone. Uh, no, so so anyway, here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the display. So this is the, this is the final DSi display. So, I guess you all have seen things that look a little bit like this before. So that's our um, seven inch display panel um, with 10 point capacitive touch, which looks really ugly because it's got the, got the membrane on the front of it. Um, so yeah, that's the product. That's the driver board on the back that's given us so much excitement, getting it done and getting it compliant. Um, and then the idea is that the Raspberry Pi, I should have got myself a screwdriver, but the idea is that the Raspberry Pi is gonna sit on top of it like that on pillars and then that goes in there. So that's, that's the product, we talked, talked about that before. Um, it, as you know, it's, it's, it's been a real effort to get this through, uh, to, you know, to get this through compliance and into manufacture, but we've done it. Um, there are something like 20,000 of these in existence at the moment, so what, what day is it today? It's the 18th of August today. Uh, there are about 20,000 of these in existence. Um, we're planning to launch it on the 31st, um, which hopefully now is in the past. Um, so we are, uh, we are going to launch this on the 31st of August this year. Um, with a bunch of stock. So that's kind of cool. And the really good news is, um, you know, one of the reasons I think we could have done this faster if we were prepared to have it be more expensive, this is usually, this is the, generally the story of Raspberry Pi, right? Uh, you're trading speed for, speed for cost, right? So, um, yeah, we spent a lot of time making this cheap. Um, this is going to be 60 US dollars uh, plus tax. So um, for UK people, that's probably in the 45 to 50 pound region, uh, including VAT. Which is kind of cool. I mean, I think that's a lot of fun for that's a lot of fun for under fifty quid, um, and um, hopefully the first of several display products. So having done this one, uh, you know, we've got ambition to do a, uh, to do a ten inch, to do a high resolution ten inch one. There'll be some challenges there. Those panels tend to be have LVDS interfaces on them, where this is a DPI panel, so there will be a respin of this board to do that. The good news is LVDS is going to be, I think, easier to get through uh, get through compliance. With the fantastic success of the quad core Raspberry Pi Model B two. Will the community see the release of an updated Model A anytime soon? That's a good question. Um, we're kind of in the same position this year that we were in in 2012 with Raspberry Pi 1, uh, which is that we're our supply of Raspberry Pis are in not in desperately short supply, not in 2012 style short supply, but there is massive demand and there's massive demand for the Model B, for the 2B. Um, so we're con kind of constrained by our supply of uh, the Broadcom devices um, and um, every Broadcom device that, that we have in the pipeline uh, is kind of earmarked to build a, um, a 2B. So I don't think you're likely to see a 2A from us this year. But it's, obvi it's an obvious it's it's an obvious product, right? You know, people like the the A plus has been the A plus. I mean, the, the A and then particularly the A plus have been pretty successful products. They're in a kind of a nice niche. Um, it would be great to do a to do a, an A. Um, I think, yeah. If we don't do one next year, I'll be very surprised. Following on from the last question. Is there any news on an updated compute module too? So following on from my previous answer, um, same same answer. Um, we um, we're using all the twenty eight thirty sixes we've got to build uh, to build um, two Bs. Yeah, obviously there's there's um, there's a desire to do a compute module two compute module compute module one's been a pretty successful little product. Um, there are a lot of people prototyping um, there are a lot of people prototyping products on Raspberry Pi two and then wanting to take them to volume uh, and compute module two is obviously a big part of that. But um, I'm now thinking it's unlikely we're going to see that in saying Q4 this year. I don't, I don't think it's gonna happen. Considering the fact that the sensor that is used in both the Pi camera and Pi Noir camera has been discontinued, 
What is next for the Raspberry Pi camera module? Um, yeah, so um, OV5647, which is the, uh, the, the sensor that's used in both of those products, got EOL'd about a year ago. Uh, we had an opportunity to do a last time buy this year. Um, so we've built up quite big stock stockpiles of those five megapixel sensors that will take us well into well into certainly well into next year at the at the earliest. Um, so yeah, uh, we we're on the lookout. Um, obviously, we are going to do a there'll be a follow on product at some point when those stockpiles burn down. There'll be a follow on product. Um, really, no no word on no word on spec yet. I mean, the goal is to provide something that's at least as good uh, at, at least as good a price. I think that twenty five dollar price has been pretty popular with people and it's just a question of what we can what we can squeeze in there has there been any more development of the replacement maynard wayland desktop um no simple simple answer um so we kind of pause to work on this a uh, couple of reasons um one um uh we want to spend the money we have we want to spend the money on the web browser so effectively what we do is we moved uh, this is done by uh, Collabora Consulting Company, yeah, based in Cambridge. Um, we took the money we were spending on um, Wayland and we started spending on Epiphany instead. Um, so the, to the extent that the browser has come on pretty fast, it's come on pretty fast because we're not spending money on, on, on um, Wayland and Maynard. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing, of course, is we've got Eric, uh, Eric Anholt working on um, um, the open source graphics drivers, uh, which then gives you a route to a very nice accelerated X. Um, implementation. So I think there is at least an evens chance that our kind of future is accelerated X rather than Wayland. So yeah, we've, we've done a bunch of work. It works pretty well. Um, there's still quite a lot of. Uh, there would be quite a big push, quite a lot of money, quite a lot of engineer time to get to push it over the line. Uh, and so we're going to make once Epiphany is uh, once Epiphany is a little further down the line. We're doing a bunch of work on WebKit two Epiphany now. So Epiphany today has been based on WebKit one. Um, we're doing about at WebKit one's kind of EOL now, right? Um, so we're doing a bunch of WebKit two Epiphany work. When that finishes, um, we'll have a look and decide whether we want to do. Uh, uh, which route we want to take to accelerate a desktop. In the meantime, of course, Simon's been doing all this fantastic work on the X desktop, so we now have this very nice LXDE world. Um, so in terms of, I guess there are two things. One's the kind of the, the shell, the, the, uh, the, the, the shell, the user experience. And then the other one is what, if any, technology you use underneath to do acceleration. Um, I think we know what our shell's going to look like now. Even if it's built on top of Wayland, it's going to look a lot like the work that Simon has been doing. Um, uh, but the question is just what acceleration framework we use. And that's a race between um, uh, Wayland getting mature and um, Eric's stuff um, churning out a usable, uh, uh, churning, churning out a usable accelerated uh, open source 3D driver and accelerated X framework. Some people were wondering about Astro Pi. I was wondering if you can give me an update on the Astro Pi project, considering the fact that we're now really quite close to Tim Peake's launch date. Cool. Uh, so by the time this interview is live, Astro Pi, the Astro Pi, um, the Sense Hat board, which is the the peripheral that we use in Astro Pi, uh, will will have gone on sale. That should have gone on sale on the twenty fourth. Um, uh, yeah, at a price of thirty dollars. Uh, which so we've managed to kind of I think we talked about a thirty-five dollar price point for that, and we've managed to squeeze that down by five dollars. So it's been it's a pretty cheap piece of kit. Um, yeah, um, the competition has been very successful. So the UK the the UK ESA, um, uh, competition around Tim Pe uh, around Tim Peaks flight. Um, the competition has been very successful. We had some great entries at primary and secondary level. Um, there's a bunch of work going on, a bunch of engineering work going on to get that software ready for flight. Um, we've got the um, uh, Jonathan and uh, Jonathan Bell and uh, uh, Dave Homus have uh, put an enormous amount of work in over the last year getting the um, hardware ready for flight. Uh, so Schneider has done a load of work on um, uh, on the software, on the, the particularly the IMU uh, software stack. Um, so yeah, um, it's ready to go up. We've got a final date. I forget when we have to deliver the hardware. I think it's in I think it's in early October. Sometime Tim's going to fly in December, um, and we'll see how it goes. I mean, really, our hope is that we can find ways to roll this out more widely. Um, I think this is going to be pretty successful. We're flying two units up. Uh, we'd like to find ways to fly more units up. The units are going to stay up when Tim comes down, uh, so they're going to be available potentially to rerun this in other ESA um, member countries. Obviously, we'd love to do you know, it's early days, but we'd love to do something with NASA. 
um, around this. Um, it was very, very kind of surprisingly, given this is the first time we've done this, really high level of engagement from kids. We've got a lot of entries to both uh, to both classes of the competition. So it's going to be great, and it's just going to be wonderful. I think um, Jonathan was saying we're one of the fastest payloads to ever go from concept to flight hardware, um, uh, which is which is kind of fun. Um, uh, we'd like to we'd like to try and find a way to sell those cases. The cases are, you've seen the, the lovely silver case. Um, they're incredibly expensive to make, um, but we'd love to find a way to sell those. But they'd be I mean they'd be thousand. They'd be kind of thousand pound pieces of kit. Um, so I'm not sure there'd be much market for them. But they are lovely and they have that kind of Apollo 13 kind of, they look like a thing that's designed to go into space. So yeah, it's great for me because I'm a big space, I'm a big space geek. And none of us are going to go, none of us are going to Kazakhstan to, to watch the launch annoyingly. So. What is your reaction to the success of the Raspberry Pi? And what do you imagine the Raspberry Pi will have changed to in 10 years time? Wow. Um, well, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, you know, the, the, the run rates have become completely insane. So, you know, it's you know, between two and 300,000 units a month. Um, a third, something like a third of Raspberry Pis are now Raspberry Pi 2s. You know, um, it's, it's that curve that's really gone very steep this year. So, yeah, it's great. Um, I, obviously, from an engineering point of view, we're doing cool stuff. From an educational point of view, particularly, you know, this year we've hired, uh, I guess you know, we've hired um, Philip Colligan, um, joined us as Foundation Chief Executive about a month ago. So we're really kind of kicking up, to kind of that, that's kind of kicking up a notch now, the, 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 the big push in, into delivering an educational mission. Um, and of course, the kind of volume of Raspberry Pi sales is a big kind of thing that lets us support that kind of, that kind of making a difference at scale, which is fun. So, so yeah, it's, um, it's weird. I was, I mean, I was talking, I was talking about, uh, um, talking to one of the, one of the distributors the other day about their next chip order, yeah, their next 1.2 million unit chip order. Um, and that's like, I said, that's, that's 80% of the lifetime volume of the BBC Micro in one chip order. <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's weird, um, but it's, it's good. Obviously, you know, we're still, we're still kind of hungry for, you know, we're hungry for a few things. I guess we're hungry for, there are some geographies, I'll maybe talk about that in a little bit. Um, we're hungry to, to kind of make it work in some areas where it's not currently successful. Um, you know, still trying to figure out how to drive cost, drive costs down. Be lovely to get a bit more cost down the platform. Um, you know, it'd be lovely to figure out ways to bring the new, the quad core device to, to, to some lower price points. Um, so there's all, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff to do. And of course we've, we've bulked out particularly this year, the last year we, we grew the software engineer, the in-house software engineering team a lot with people we hired, um, um, from Broadcom. Um, this year we've, we've grown the hardware engineering team. So we've had Mike Stimson joined us at the start of the year. Um, uh, Roger Thornton has just joined us. They're both, um, ex-Broadcom. Um, people, so we've now got quite a decent-sized in-house hardware engineering team. Um, so yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's fun. Yeah, and where is it? What's it going to look like in ten years' time? Um, oh, well, it's going to look like this, right? Because <laughs> it's because that's what a Raspberry Pi looks like. And so really, the question is, what can you fit into that? What can you fit into that box in ten years' time? Um, obviously, some more processing power. Um, I don't actually think vast amounts more processing power. I think sort of sort of various trends in in in, in chips. I mean that I, I could imagine us only. I don't think we'll have a hundred times the processing power. I don't think we'll have a modern desktop PCs worth of processing power in this form factor in this power envelope in in, in ten years' time. I think we'll have more than we have now. Um, uh, I, I hope we'll have did, um, uh, addressed yeah, a little bit more memory. Maybe I think there's probably there's probably maybe a little more hope of more memory than there of significantly more memory than there is of significantly more processing power. Um, what else? Um, probably, prob I'm guessing it's got to be high speed interfaces, right? I mean, it's likely we've sort of committed to the to the form factor. I think it's pretty obvious that USB C is going to be a is going to be a big thing. So I, I would expect that by ten years time, that end of the board is might might look a little bit different. Um, I mentioned we probably still have Ethernet on it because we like Ethernet. Might be slightly faster Ethernet, um, but I would suspect that this bit here is probably going to look a little bit more USB-C shaped. Um, conceivably, in a in a maximally USB-C world, we might not even have that, right? Because you know you can move a lot of video over, US, over those USB-C cables. Um, so there might be a bit of a bit of uh, jiggering around, but um, that's not a product announcement. <laughs>
This is not a product announcement. This is a speculation about industry trends. Make sure that that bit gets, uh, goes in the video. Are there any plans in the future to update Minecraft Pi Edition to take advantage of the hardware present on the Pi 2? Um, well, Raspberry Pi 2 doesn't have any new hardware, right? It just has uh, more um, processing power. Uh, and, and Minecraft Pi already takes advantage of that. So there are some great demos of things like big stacks of dynamite that just don't work on Pi 1 and work pretty well on Pi 2. Uh, I think the question really is, do we get a version of Minecraft Pi that rolls in all the updates that have gone into the Pocket Edition in the last three years? And do we get a version that integrates better with the desktop environment, and in particular with future desktop, whether that's Wayland or, or, or Eric's stuff? Um, we have a good relationship now, obviously, with Microsoft. Uh, who conveniently bought Mojang. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do something. Um, you know, I think it's become such a central part of education on Raspberry Pi that we have to, you know, we have to do, do something there. Um, uh, Microsoft very supportive of this, of this, of this stuff. Mm. Microsoft very supportive of Raspberry Pi. Uh, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty optimistic. Um, I, I, I'm probably inclined to I'd, I'd prefer to, I think I'd probably prefer to do one update, which rolls in both of those things, right? So I'm not maybe um, pushing as hard for an update now. I think I'd rather solve the accelerated desktop challenge and then go and get the update at that point when everything's kind of, kind of settled. But yeah, there will be, I, I'm, obviously it's not my decision, but I'm um, very confident that something will happen. What has been the reaction to the Windows 10 IoT operating system that is available for the Raspberry Pi? Have you seen a large uptake of users, or is it for more specialised uses? Um, really positive, actually. I mean, it's been it's been good. I think that people we've had an enormous number of downloads. I mean, you know, you know tens of thousands of downloads of uh, of the of the image. Um, it's I think it is for specialised uses in that it's not a desktop. Environment. It's not a. It's not a, a platform for um, you know using your Pi as a as a general purpose computer. Uh, but it turns out those specialized uses are enormously common specialized uses of the Raspberry Pi. You know any kind of industrial control, anything that anything that looks like digital signage. Um, you know, uh, I think Windows is pretty Windows is pretty suitable for. Um, so so I think that's where I think that's where you're going to see it. I think you're going to see some hobbyist stuff, and then you're going to see some um, uh, industrial. Um, stuff, but it's in that kind of embedded control, uh, embedded display drive and embedded control kind of world. What are some of the most popular industrial or commercial uses of the Raspberry Pi board and compute module that you have seen? Um, let's see, popular uses. Um, digital signage is enormous. Um, and Pi is a great little platform for driving for, for driving displays. So in the past, you know, if, if you go if you go wander around, you see an awful lot of digital signage uh, boxes out there which have a little small form factor PC bounted, bolted onto the back. The Pi is generally better than those devices. Um, so increasingly, I look behind every display I see in public now, and quite often I see a Raspberry Pi behind them. So digital signage, either either people rolling their own, just going getting a Pi and sticking it behind something, or um, uh, third parties building content delivery platforms on top of the Pi, um, you're packaging the Pi as a digital, digital signage player, and that happens a lot. Um, so that's a big one. Um, generic industrial control, so sort of process automation in factories. Um, you see you see a lot of that. So you see people buying. And this is kind of, this is kind of the, again, this kind of uh, sort of split between DIY industrial and product-based industrial. So you see sometimes people, um, you know, buying 100 pies and sticking it in their factory with some software they've written to control their factory. And then sometimes you see people building factory automation solutions, which they then sell that are based around the pie. Um, so and that's been a big thing for Compute Module. There's so, uh, quite a few people who've been using Compute Module are people who've been building automation platforms um, that run the Pi software. Um, so that's been kind of fun. Um, yeah, it's it's about we think it's about a third of our market. You know, we think we're selling probably a million units a year into what you'd recognise as being industrial and embedded, which is a, it's, it's a good run rate. Uh, the nice thing is it's a better it's actually a better platform than most of the existing incumbents. Um, people, I think people started being interested in, in it. People get interested in the Pi because it's cheap, and then they actually stick with it because it's stable. Um, yeah, cheap, cheap doesn't actually count for a lot in these in, in this space. Um, 
because uh, you know if you're if you buy a cheap product and then it takes your factory down for half an hour, then you lose the money that you would otherwise have that you, that, that, that you saved. Um, so people are using the really surprising one I saw I saw last year was um, I went to a factory and I, I, they were building products, one of which had a pie in, and um, it was a, tele a telecoms product, so it was a rack unit to go in a, a base station, in a, a cellular base station, um, and it had, you know, tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars of stuff, FPGA magic in there, and then a pie as the controller. And that was the bit where I, that was the bit where I realised that, yeah, if there was a product which was ten times the price of the pie, one percent more stable, you would use that instead of the pie in that platform. And that was really the day that I realized, that was the middle of last year, and that was the day that I realized that people were using the pie because it's high quality, not because it's cheap, um, which is great. So, so it's kind of nice that people can have the best product and also it happens to be, it happens to be cheap. With the release of new Raspberry Pi boards and new Raspberry Pi hardware, some people in the community were wondering whether industrial or educational customers would ever get any high visibility of the Raspberry Pi roadmap for future purchases and support. Uh, simple answer, no. Um, so this is really, this is really, this is difficult for us, right? Because you know what it was like with the Raspberry Pi one. We said we were going to do it, and then we talked incessantly <laughs> about all of the challenges that we had doing it, <coughs> and it's. It's quite nice to be able to share that. It's educational to be able to share that. It's quite nice to be able to, to, to tell people this stuff. But the problem is you can't do it once you're a real business because you've got, you know, you think about the, yeah, there's, we'll sell 3 million Raspberry Pi 2s this year, and that's $100 million worth of hardware, right? So there's $100 million moving around. If I announce Raspberry Pi 8 today in this interview, right, then people just stop buying those. <laughs> Right, and then you vaporize tens and tens of tens of millions of pounds of value. Our our money, RS's money, Farnell's money. I just can't do it. So um, no, we, we won't give very much visibility. I, I think the I think the important thing to focus on is we don't EOL products. You know what have we EOL'd? I mean, we EOL'd the original Model A. We EOL'd the Rev One, the Rev One Model B. You can still buy Rev Two, Model B. Um, you can still buy, you know, we, we haven't EOL'd anything. Uh, we will EOL the camera board, but that's because our component vendor EOL'd the product, but we'll introduce a, a, an equivalent replacement product. Um, we don't EOL products, and therefore if you're an industrial customer, you can keep buying, you don't, you can keep buying the units that you were buying before. Um, yeah, you don't get um, a free, you know, you don't get notice that you're going to get a magic free upgrade, but if you if you're happy, if you make a decision to buy a Raspberry Pi today, that's a perfectly, and then I release a better Raspberry Pi for the same price tomorrow, you haven't lost out. You know, you made a yeah, absolutely, there was a better decision you could have made, but you still made a good economic decision. You you decided that you would rather have a Raspberry Pi or a current generation Raspberry Pi than your thirty five dollars. You made an economic decision. Um, and it was a good decision, and you should be pleased with it. And yeah, it, 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 obviously, you know, people hate it when they're, if you are the last person to buy a Raspberry Pi 4 before we launch a Raspberry Pi 5, um, then yeah, you're going to feel sad. But ultimately, it's $35. What are your opinions on ways to increase the number of Raspberry Pis for education in developing countries? Um, so developing, the developing world is a, is a, is a massive opportunity for Pis. It's a massive opportunity for the, the foundation's mission, obviously. Um, it's an opportunity to help some developing countries not fall into the tablet trap. Um, you know, the, the tablet trap is this idea you can leapfrog over the PC into a world of tablets, which means you basically leapfrogged over the thing that might cause your country to develop a domestic computer economy uh, into a thing that traps your country in just consuming things from somewhere else. So it's an opportunity for countries to escape from that particular threat. Um, it's also a commercial opportunity for, for Pi. Um, yeah, I think there's a, a wonderful opportunity for us to go actually go sell product and, and make money in the developing world. Um, how are we going to do it? Um, well, look at where we're not strong at the moment. We're not strong in Af basically we're not strong in Africa and South America. So you know, the southern hemisphere is is, is tough for us at the moment. Uh, two very different reasons. Um, Africa is largely a logistical reason. 
Um, it's, a, it's a logistical and a communications reason. It's hard to get the, the word out that the part exists. It's hard to educate people about what the advantages are of having a computer in, in, in their lives. Uh, and then it's hard to get physical product into a lot of, uh, even to the African capital cities, pretty hard to get, almost impossible to get them, certainly in a centralized way, in a sort of central planning way, hard for us to get pies um, uh, into rural Africa. Um, so what we've been doing mostly in Africa is a kind of a trying to find local entrepreneurs who can build a business around the pie. And so we've been providing pies to um, hack spaces in uh, yeah, in kind of African capital cities. Certainly uh, Nairobi, we did done a couple of other ones. We did some stuff I think in Ghana, uh, some stuff in Botswana. Um, uh, and typically, what we're doing there is we will give you know ten raspberry pies for the hack space to use, and then ten raspberry pies for the hack space to sell. And the idea is if they can manage to sell them then they can build a self-sustaining business around that. We're just trying to find those entrepreneurs who are going to be, um, going to be your kind of value-added, become your value-added resellers. Um, been a slow burn at the moment in Africa. They do show up, um, but there's that kind of domestic entrepreneur scene hasn't really happened yet, and we're still trying to figure out how to make that happen. Um, I've always said, you know, if I could find the right person, the right Africa person, to go and drive strategy in Africa, I'd hire them in an instant, but I just don't know that person. And I don't have the skills required to successfully detect the right person, to successfully hire the right person, distinguish between somebody who's very competent in that area and someone who isn't. Um, so so we, that's something we've not done yet. Um, I have a guy called uh, Graham Schrucker, who's a good friend of ours, who, who works part-time for us out of, uh, out of South Africa, and he coordinates a lot of these shipments. But that's as close as I've got to having somebody uh, to, do, to do Africa for us. Um, South America is largely a tariffs issue, it's a taxes and tariffs issue, particularly Brazil has a very complicated tax and tariff structure. Um, we are, we actually built 2,000, so Sony have a factory in Brazil, uh, we actually built 2,000 B pluses last year there. Um, so we do have the capability to build locally, and building locally is, the, is usually the way to get around these tariff things. You know, the tariffs are largely there to encourage you to build locally, so if you build locally you get a, you get a good deal. Um, Right now, I mean, the price of a Raspberry Pi 2 has gone from being about 105 US dollars in Brazil to about 70 US dollars, which is a good improvement. Um, I'm really hopeful over the next year we'll find a way to bring that down into the kind of 50 range. And I think 50 is fine if you think, you know, Raspberry Pi, including VAT in the UK, costs, 30, costs $42. You know, $50 in a high tax regime like, uh, like Brazil would not be a bad would not be a bad deal. So we, we kind of, we'd like to do something in South America. Um, we think we've got a plan. Another question that I received was, why does the foundation promote Python instead of a more traditional and more widely used language such as C? Um, okay, so I think Python is probably more widely used than C. I think there are more people who program in Python than there are in C. What I like about Python, I'm a C programmer, you know, I used to be, I actually used to be one of these guys who used C as a scripting language. So every time I wanted to like write a little utility, I'd just write it from scratch in C using, you know, for scan to read stuff out of files and stuff, you know. Um, but, um, uh, and I learned Python specifically to force myself to stop doing that because it's insane, right? Um, they're both languages which are good for different things. As computers get more powerful, obviously, the kind of things that you can get away with doing in an interpretive language like Python um, uh, change. Uh, the, you can do a broader range of things in Python as the Python VMs become more sophisticated. So if you're using PyPy, PyPy allows you to do more stuff, you know, gives you more performance, so you can do more stuff in, in Python instead of C. There are always going to be some things you want to do in C. Um, so why do we promote Python? We promote Python because it is a language in which hello world is print hello world, at least for Python 2, for Python 3 they put brackets in. Um, for Python 2 it's print hello world, um, all the way up to, uh, but has a uh, one language which goes all the way up to you can be a professional software engineer who only knows Python. That's not true of basic. No, so basic has limits because hello world is print hello world, but sooner or later you run out of the stuff you can do in basic. Languages like C and Java, say, much more powerful up at the top end, you know, you can, you can build, you know, particularly C, you know, you've got a lot, a lot of performance available to you, but their Hello World program is more complicated and requires you to take more on faith. So if you look at the Java Hello World program, you know, uh, you have to declare a class and then public static void main string arg system dot out dot print learn hello world. And you have to say to somebody when you're teaching them, just ignore all of this. 
you don't have to know what all of this stuff does, just look at this bit. And that sucks, right? Because it sucks for a teaching language because you, your first thing you say to somebody who's trying to learn to program shouldn't be, uh, I'm going to show you some magic and you don't need to know how it works. Um, so that's the good thing about Python is that, that dynamic range between the simplicity of the simplest program and the power of the most complex program. Recently, it has been reported that there have been problems at Premier Farnell, a manufacturer of the Raspberry Pi, in terms of disappointing sales results that eventually led to the ousting of their CEO. Does this have any effect at all on the Raspberry Pi and or the Raspberry Pi Foundation? Uh, no. So Farnell have, Farnell have been great partners for us. Um, I think Pi has been a pretty successful business at Farnell. Um, you know, we don't expect any. We don't expect any change. We we love working with. We love working with Farnell, and we very much hope they love working with us. And finally, this was the most popular question by a long shot. Are you related at all to Jason Statham? I, I don't believe I'm related to Jason Statham. I don't. I don't talk like him. And as you see, I, I I've made some effort over the last couple of months to uh, to distance myself from, uh, from from the Jason Statham thing. This is uh, this is nearly you know obviously caused a lot of trouble in my marriage having this on the front of my face. But it, I, I'm hoping that, that that's going to open clear blue. That and the fact that I have nothing like his his musculature. I'm hoping that will kind of like open clear blue water between me and him.